successful programme of activity. So all I have to do is to thank you all very much for coming. I think we'll go through the, the, the terms and conditions in terms of putting your hands up and that sort of stuff later. So I'll just hand over to Graham now and wish you all a very successful event. I'm looking forward to being part of it and uh, meeting all of you later on today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, can I just echo uh, Ben's thanks to everybody? Thank you very much for attending and thanks to the panelists and, and of course the, uh, the sponsors. And I will go through some of the uh, uh, housekeeping as we go through this session. But um, it's uh, great to have uh, you here and obviously also our colleagues who are online and thank you for joining us from uh, wherever you are. I'm delighted to say that we've got quite a number of uh, the Maritime Skills Commissioners uh, here uh, today and online, but if those colleagues in the audience who are part of the Maritime Skills Commission, I'm putting your hand up just to identify yourselves and colleagues, they would welcome the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you afterwards, I'm sure, and to hear your ideas about how we can take things forward. One of the key characteristics of the Commission is that we see it very much as a two-way process and we're very, very keen to uh, get your views and your experiences and that, will, I hope, will become apparent as we go through today's session. Um, my name is Graham Baldwin, as Ben has been said. Uh, I have the pleasure of chairing the Maritime Skills Commission, as well as being the Vice Chancellor at the University of uh, Central Lancashire. And there's no doubt that uh, in whatever hat I have on, the issue of green skills, uh, green jobs is a big one. So it's a great pleasure to be here today. And um, we work very closely with the Department for Transport, who have given us our initial tasks, and we work closely with Maritime UK to ensure that we've got uh, a an appropriate pipeline of talented individuals who can uh, make their way and service all parts of the maritime sector. So we're about understanding skills needs. We're about ensuring there are no gaps, ensuring that there's the appropriate qualifications, et cetera. It's a really interesting challenge. And we've been working through a scheme of work over the last uh, 18 months or so, and we are now looking to refresh that scheme of work. And one of the things that has clearly cropped up for us is this whole issue of green jobs, green skills, and what's required for the future. I want to be honest with you from the start and the purpose of today is we don't know the answers to that, but we are um, wanting to work with yourselves and people across the industry to inform us so that we can come up with a, 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 position, uh, a, a position statement almost in terms of where we sit with regard to green skills and green jobs. And when you speak to people, there are many different definitions and interpretations and different views as to what is required. So we want to have that discussion and what better place to have that discussion than here at COP26. And that's why we're so delighted to, to be hosting this. So what we're going to do today, we're going to work through, um, we're gonna hear from our panelists who all have some background and experience in these key issues. Uh, we'll then uh, open it up to Q&A. We've got some uh, questions already submitted and we'll try to work through those, but then we'll open it up to colleagues in the virtual audience and people here. Um, please do feel free to uh, comment, to question, and we will capture all of that. And the intention is that we will bring that all together. Uh, and we've got a strategic planning meeting in December, and we intend to feed this very much into that so that we've got our next scheme of work. And the one thing that I think we are clear about is that green skills, green jobs, whatever we end up calling this, is not going to be a separate column of our work, along with the work we've been doing in, on ports or the work we've been doing with uh, regard to uh, cadets and so forth. This is something that's going to weave its way through all of the things that we do. And I think that's the one thing that we've learned in our previous evidence gathering session with regard to this topic is that it doesn't stand alone. It weaves its way through all of the work we do. It's, it's a significant underpinner and we need to work out the best way of dealing with that. That's why we're very excited. So I will move on quickly so we get to the people who really do know uh, about this topic. Um, but just some of the housekeeping, as we mentioned, uh, whilst we're going through the presentations, if everyone in the virtual audience could please stay muted. And then when we move to the Q&A session, uh, can question, questioners please start by introducing yourselves um, and also identifying whether your question is generally for the panel or whether it's for one of our uh, specific individuals. And we will then ask you to take yourself off mute to ask your question. Uh, and we've also, as I said, had some questions that have been already sent in, and we will address those questions at the end of it. And just in terms of giving 
a, a sense of structure, but not trying to limit the presentations. We've asked the following questions, and we'd be interested to hear from you if you have answers to these yourselves. Will your business need to reskill or retrain your workforce to transition towards net zero? And if no, then what evidence do you have to support that? We'd also be interested to hear about how will or is your business reskilling, retraining your workforce to transition to net zero? Because you may be ahead of the game in a way, be uh, well onto this. What needs to happen for your business to reskill and retrain your workforce? And we're looking to see what we can do to help on that basis. What support will your business require in terms of the reskilling and retraining? And what do you see as the biggest challenge that you face in that reskilling and retraining? Now, there'll be many more questions, but that's just to give us a, a sort of framework and a template to go through the Q&A uh, at, the, at the end of this. Uh, and as I say, that we'll start off with the, the preset question. So I'm, I'm going to hand over to our panelists. I'm delighted that on the panel with me today, we've got Paul Wicks, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Cornwall Marine Network, uh, David Tyler, the Commercial Director, and Dr. Ian Percy, the CEO from Artemis Technologies. We've got Alan Ralston, the Director of Energy and Renewables from Harland and Wolf, and Alan Dixon, the second engineer from Scotland and a member of the Nautilus International. And colleagues will introduce themselves and say a little bit more about themselves uh, when they uh, start off with their presentations. So um, that's the purpose of the afternoon. That's how we'll run it. We can be very flexible, really looking forward to engaged two-way dialogue that will inform the Commission and enable us to go forward with a better understanding of the requirements around green skills and green jobs. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul Wicks, Chief Executive Officer of Cornwall Marine Network. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Graham. Um, good afternoon, everybody um, that's here live and joining virtually. I've got my colleague, Aurelie, tucked away in Cornwall, who's going to help out with any tricky questions that you decide to ask. Um, Cornwall Marine Network is part of Maritime UK Southwest, and we've got more than 350 local marine businesses who are our members. And for the past 17 years, we've been supporting them to grow with skills and workforce development, along the way creating more than 4,000 new jobs in the county. And that includes more than 1,400 new apprenticeships in small businesses. And we've engaged more than half, um, so that's 8,000 out of 16,000 marine workers in some form of skills improvement along the way. Um, we'll be addressing the questions uh, that have been set from the perspective of our member businesses and how our team at CMN will support them on this journey. Will marine businesses in Cornwall need to reskill to tr transition to net zero? Absolutely yes, because the efforts required to transition are proportionate to the challenges we're facing. Despite the global pandemic and the lockdowns, greenhouse gas emissions across the world hit a new record in 2020, and the United Nations has warned of a code red for humanity, unless we urgently decarbonize our economy. We all know that business as usual won't do to reach net zero targets. We need to significantly invest in new technologies, new ways of working, and crucially, in new skills. We all know Sorry, some of our local Cornish businesses are world leading experts in marine renewables supply chain activity and are already pioneering innovative technologies, but efforts need to be implemented across the whole workforce. The government has set an ambition to support 2 million green jobs by 2030, and we know that the offshore wind sector, for example, is expected to employ 60,000 people by 2030. Excuse me. up from 11,000 today. So where are the re remaining 1.9 million green jobs? Potentially they're everywhere. Most existing jobs with appropriate training could be made greener. A starting point is to define exactly what, the, what are the green jobs. Um, we think there are four categories. We have jobs that are green by nature, such as conservationists and ecologists. We have jobs like wind farm installation where the job has a green purpose but we are redirecting previous engineering and construction skills to the new green purpose. Then we have engagement skills, such as communication and community engagement on green issues, promoting the needs and benefits. And finally, we have supporting skills, which are needed to make a business greener to operate. Here we can define our green credentials by running procurement tenders, when selecting contract providers, for example, 
or in the selection of a bank or pension fund. A report only last week highlighted that changing where your pension is invested as a company can create more impact than going vegan, stopping flying, and moving to an electric vehicle combined. But of course, we also need to be doing all of this as well. It's actually quite an empowering message. You don't need to be an engineer working on an offshore wind farm to actively contribute to net zero, although we need these engineers too, and the relevant training to support the growth of that emerging industry. How will we reskill and retrain the workforce to transition to net zero? As a starting point, the ambition to transition to net zero needs to be reflected in a company's ethos and culture. I was interested to find out Cornwall has the second highest number of B Corp certified businesses in the UK after Bristol. This is currently the only certification that measures a company's entire social and environmental performance. The leadership team of every business needs to set the example and implement an ambitious sustainability action plan and clear commitments and targets. And appointing sustainability champions across the team in the same way that we have health and safety officers or, or safeguard leads. Cornwall Marine Network is on this path and we have produced our own sustainability action plan and we're going to make it available to our members as a template that they can then use to help and inform the development of their own plans. Education and communication are key to get employers and employees buy-in, whether it's for simple actions such as switching to green search engines or collective decisions to opt for greener pension funds. It's also important to acknowledge two job market trends. We know that we're, we've moved from a career for life to a life of careers and workers are now predicted to hold between 10 and 13 different job roles in their lifetime. This means transferable skills will become increasingly important. So we are not su surprised to see the top five skills in demand by 2025, according to the World Economic Forum, are analytical thinking, active learning, complex problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity. The skills market will polarize with a greater demand for these new high-level skills as we engage and deploy emerging technologies in our sector, such as programming autonomous vessels or monitoring offshore wind turbines. The second trend is that job roles are expected to become more hybrid, covering different technologies and disciplines, such as moving between diesel and electric propulsion systems or working in oil and gas or, um, to offshore wind. These changes need to be reflected in future training pr provision and training providers need to be proactive and flexible to anticipate what employers want and design relevant course content. This is what Cornwall Marine Network are currently doing and will continue to do through a number of our skills capacity building projects. Employers are invited to co-design and feedback on new curriculum content. Once des designed, we test and roll this out by delivering at the employer premises. What our research has shown, and in line with the two job market trends I mentioned, is that additional short course bolt-on skills seen, uh, seem to be what is needed to reskill the workforce uh, in marine, including marine renewables, and this is what we're focusing on. As an example, we would need to teach boat handling and sea safety skills to a marine engineer so they can deploy their skills at sea to maintain floating offshore wind turbines. What needs to happen for the business to retrain and reskill? And what support will the business members need to reskill? I've joined these together. There are several issues here, so I'll share some thinking. We know that in our sector, we generally have an aging skilled workforce. Um, and if we look at the world of boat building and shipbuilding, for example, with some businesses expecting up to 35% of their skilled workforce to retire in the next 10 to 15 years. We need to decide which of these skills need replacing and have a program to do this including adding the bolt-on skills that will be needed, but also developing the new skilled pathways to serve the em emerging fuels and technologies. We need to be working with our business businesses now to plan this. We don't want a situation that happened when historically some indus industries have closed, like coal mining, when tens of thousands of workers were discarded. We need a plan um, to plan a transition to prepare our current workforce for the new opportunities. Let's put a value on the skilled workers who will be retiring. This is the source of some additional volunteer marine ambassadors to work with schools to promote future career opportunities in our sector. 
A number of them may be the part-time tutors of the future if we equip them with the training and the materials to deliver. We have a national shortage of skilled engineers, so Cornwall Marine Network plans to develop a number of employer-based training centres in local communities to make future training more accessible to the businesses, especially to small businesses and remove the need for learners to travel to training. Local businesses have been using the kickstart scheme or apprenticeship incentives to create jobs that will support the net zero transition. CMN has been researching, consulting with businesses and developing new curriculum to pilot delivery and help small businesses access, access these public sector incentives. But this work needs to be scaled up. We need to gear up education and training for green growth. For this, we need the government to help and targeted actions and investment could have a huge impact to date, only 1% of kickstart placements have been in jobs designated as green, so we need to expand this opportunity. From an industry and employer perspective, why can't we lobby to extend the kickstart scheme to continue past March 2022, specifically to subsidise job placements that contribute to the green transition, with a requirement for employers to report on green indicators? It would encourage businesses to contribute to net zero targets whilst creating jobs and reducing youth unemployment. For apprentices, the government is currently offering a £3,000 grant to employers, creating vacancies, but this will be phased out in a few months. Again, why not extend it for green or greener jobs to design a green jobs wage incentive scheme, for example. From a training provider perspective and to help accelerate the development of green course content, the government has the gift to provide higher funding rates through the adult education budget or apprenticeship contracts when the training delivery addresses green skills. Adult education budget is 50% lower in real terms than 10 years ago, and, as a key and it's a key resource for employers to upskill their workforce and support staff with their career progression. So this is really concerning and something that needs to be looked at as a key instrument to support the net zero transition. And what will be the biggest challenge to reskilling and retraining? Right now, businesses are hesitating to join the net zero race as early adopters or market followers, given the risks associated with investing in a new technology and expanding into new markets at a time when we don't know yet which technology holds the best chance of success. Should vessels go electric or hybrid? Do we bet on hydrogen or alternative fuels? So for net zero to happen, there need to be three things that happen together. We need infrastructure investment, for example, imports to prepare them for their servicing and supply chain role to support deployment and maintenance of offshore wind using floating or fixed turbines. If we are really committed to reaching 60 percent of UK content in offshore wind, this includes revisiting and reinstating contracts for different subsidy payments to offshore energy device developers to incentivize a reduction in the time needed to develop and deploy the new devices that will be needed to generate electricity and produce hydrogen from wave and tidal devices in addition to wind. Second, we need to improve technology readiness, which requires collaboration between universities and businesses, but also requires real backup from the finance and insurance sectors. The first large scale 500 megawatt UK floating offshore wind projects are expected to use long term finance, uh, uh, long term debt to finance a substantial proportion of the projects, but we need to ensure that the finance community understands floating offshore wind projects, technologies, risks and opportunities. At the same time, insurance premiums for offshore wind farms have been rising sharply in recent years. We, want, uh, we need to understand what the industry can do to address any concerns and what opportunities there might be for more appropriate insurance structures to be used within the industry to provide adequate insurance uh, more cost effectively. We're looking to the Maritime Skills Commission to promote a guide to our sector on the emerging needs and priorities for green skills. And our event today is planned to help inform that roadmap. We will then use our funds to enable us to consult with our small business employers to research and develop the new skills and pilot opportunities in Cornwall. We'll need to develop some areas of new curriculum that will be needed. We'll pilot these new skills delivery and new national qualifications in the Southwest for the benefit of national rollout through our regional cluster council structure. And the funding we have gives us nearly three years to work with all stakeholders to start to make a difference with maritime green skills. Thank you. Great. 
Thanks very much indeed, Paul. Really interesting, really informative. Great to get the perspective from, uh, from Cornwall. Uh, we'll obviously have the opportunity to come back and ask uh, questions of all panelists, including Paul at the end, but we'll move straight on. And if I can, I'd like to introduce David Tyler and Dr. Ian Percy from Artemis Technologies. Thanks, colleague. Hi, everyone. Oh, am I on? Am I? Yep. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? It's a nice setting um, to be talking about this really important subject. Um, I'm the CEO of Artemis Technologies. We're a spin-off from a race team um, that produces zero emissions vessels, fast vessels um, for up to about 180 tonnes. So we're talking crew transfer vessels, fast ferries, um, and workboat type boats to get your head around what it is. And um, I'm really excited to be talking here. I, you know, I've formed teams in lots of different formats, be it for a race team around the world, and then here for the first time in the UK in Belfast for a commercial venture for a um, emissions reduction venture in maritime. And um, I've found a lot of different experiences around the world. And, and I'm proud to say, I think we built a team now in Belfast that's just as strong as it was when I built one in San Francisco with unlimited budgets and as just as good as I have done in, in, in Spain when the America's Cup was there. And, um, and I think that the, the point that you mentioned about culture is something that I feel is, is so important to bring with this new um, green agenda because one of the reasons I think we've managed to build such a strong team is that everyone has joined behind a very common mission of um, climate mitigation in the same way we did when we were trying to build a team around winning a race and you know there's a lot of those analogies are used um, with regard to climate action but for us it's felt very very easy for people to understand and be dedicated but um, I'm going to pass over to David to answer the specific points because our, our experience has been quite, you know, has been quite varied. And as opposed to importing skills, we are very much now trying to train for the new skills that we require for our for our technology. It won't be and won't in any way be applicable to all the technologies that are required for the green transition. But certainly, I think there'll be some common themes. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Paul. I think. From my perspective, I think the, the route to net zero is constantly evolving and I think we need to be very agile and, you know, we don't necessarily know all the skills that we're going to need to get there uh, by, by 2050 and hopefully earlier. Um, I think for Artemis Technologies, we're, we're in a good position in that we're actually building... <laughs> so sad, <Nahri. laughs> We're in a, in, a, in a good position when we're building our company now. Um, so we're, rather than having to sort of re, retrain them... There's also a bit of, um, I guess, diffusion of knowledge between different sectors happening, particularly within our company. We have people from automotive, motorsport, oh. who haven't actually worked in maritime before. And, and we're developing new technologies for maritime that don't necessarily have any sort of um, regulatory roadmap either as well. So we're trying to, we're trying to utilize the, uh, the best skills within the maritime sector in terms of naval architecture and design, performance prediction of our systems and vessels, but also bring over that knowledge from the other sectors. And they're having to retrain and understand the implications of bringing that tech into the maritime environment, which is a new experience for everyone, but it's also a really exciting challenge and one we're, um, we're all enjoying sort of taking on together. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks both. Uh, really interesting. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions coming back around that and uh, uh, particularly uh, noted your point there about transferability and that importance of going across sectors. And I think that, that dovetails with some of what... Uh, oh, yeah. Um, okay, we're moving along. And uh, my pleasure now to introduce Alan Ralston, who is the Director of Energy and Renew Renewables from Harland and Wolf. Thanks. That was a mouthful, John. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I've been with Harland and Wolf's uh, earlier this year. I joined. Um, it's a brand that's been synonymous um, with shipbuilding probably for the last 160 years of its, of its heritage. Um, we are 22 months into our rebirth. We've acquired four sites in that time, most notably Belfast, uh, late 19, 
or an Appledore facility near Devon uh, last summer, and two Scottish sites in Methyl and Arnish in February of this year. So, you know, we've got a strong footprint in the UK, if not the largest fabrication footprint now. Um, there are five markets in which we trade, defence, renewables, energy, which is a blend of, I guess, carbon capture and oil and gas, um, cruise and ferry and commercial marine. So it's a fairly spread and, and, and you know, uh, wide portfolio of opportunities that we, that we are active uh, in executing. Um, each of them bring different dynamics. I've got a defence, renewables, and oil and gas background. Um, and I think in the context of the questions that Graham set out, you know, Belfast, as I mentioned, is a long history. It's been through various ownership structures in recent years, and by consequence, we've got an aging workforce. Um, and that's probably one of our biggest challenges in terms of reskilling, retraining um, those individuals, uh, obviously, to make sure that the platform that we're building as a group um, is sustainable. Um, we, our locations of our facilities, some would argue, are in maybe underprivileged areas in some respects. Um, the access to the right support financially or otherwise is, is very limited. Um, we have invested over £10 million so far as a group into remediation of equipment facilities. We've brought in 34 apprentices in the last three months across the group, which is a, a really a, a, a shot in the arm for us as a business and for the industry in which we serve. Um, so yeah, we are actively, we're on a journey, as, as I've mentioned, we're only 20 months into, into that journey. Um, but we are actively looking at how we address, looking in the rearview mirror, the kind of workforce that, that we've, we're building in Belfast and our other sites, um, how we can build on the apprentice programme that we've now got in place. And I think many of us have the same challenges where you know, there are burgeoning industries, not just renewables, power generation amongst others. We're all fishing in the same pond for talent, for, you know, whether it's blue collar, white collar, it doesn't really matter. It's, you're still facing those same challenges. And it's, you know, there are um, financial challenges within that in terms of he who pays the most for some of that resource. Um, the lack of subsidy or grant type support for um, anything that we want to do is, is something that I'm keen to see um, changing. Um, we think that, I guess, you look at education providers, trade unions, organisations such, such as ourselves, and other key stakeholders need to work together, you, you know, in utopian terms, to come up with the right solution. Um, and I'm sure that's going to be one of the outcomes from this session. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, the, the key challenge that we face going forward, as I mentioned, is as a rear view mirror, and there's looking at the windscreen, if you like, if I can use that analogy, how, how we bring our skills, our skills and workforce up to, to speed with how technology is advancing. Um, and also those uh, aspects of talent, as I say, blue collar, white collar, how we equip them for, for the future. I mentioned investment. We are looking at site optimization because you look at renewables. Um, offshore wind was mentioned and it's a, a key growth area for us. Cost is king in that, in that environment. You know, there's a lot of offshoring of contracts and jobs, which obviously, you know, from a governmental perspective, is looking to actively address to drive local content targets to be met in the UK, of which we are key to be a part of. Um, and the investment that's required in making you competitive and driving efficiency in how you execute is critical. Um, and obviously, to, to train the people, our workforce, our staff, to be able to use that equipment, whether it's automated or otherwise, um, is another key challenge. So that, that in effect, kind of sums our kind of thinking around the kind of reskilling for uh, for the transition that we're in. I think leaning on my oil and gas background, I think they're going through a, what is, what's called a just transition at the moment. Um, how the, the migration of skills from oil and gas into offshore wind is an example. I think there's a lot of learning to be gained from what's going on with Oil and Gas UK amongst many others. Um, but we're very closely monitoring what's going on in the political and environmental landscape to make sure that we're learning from it and, and in some cases we're ahead of the game. We, we were actually warned that um, the lights would go out and we needed to be a bit more active on these. The, so we've obviously been too uh, sedate, colleagues. So, yeah. So anyway, we'll see. <clears throat> I'm sure you can still see us. So, so thank you. So, uh, the, Alan, thank you very much for that. And sorry that the lights came down on you at, uh, at the last there. But, uh, um, OK, and we'll just move on to our last of our presenters today, Alan Dixon.
so welcome, Alan. Alan is, as already mentioned, a second engineer from Scotland and part of Nautilus International. Over to you, Alan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just a, a quick uh, introduction from myself. Um, I'm a second engineer. Um, I've worked both deep sea and around the UK coast, and I've uh, been in the industry for 20 years. Um, I've been asked uh, today to give my thoughts on the seafarer's perspective as to what skills will be required for the transition to net zero. Um, but before I do that, I'd like to consider a major point um, of retraining and upskilling for the net zero transition and beyond, and that is you need a workforce. Um, the pandemic has had quite a brutal impact on the 1.6 million seafarers worldwide. Um, many of the nations gathered here today for this conference uh, were more than happy to let ships into their ports to load and discharge cargo, but they didn't really have any interest in the seafarers on board doing the work. Um, shore leave was not an option. Medical attention and crew changes were generally very difficult and hundreds of thousands of seafarers were stuck on board months after the contract, and in some cases, up to a year. Companies or shipping companies blamed the governments. Governments blamed COVID. But there were a few that did actually manage to show that with the proper precautions, safe crew transfers and changes were possible, but the majority weren't interested in the extra work. It did show us that the Maritime Labour Convention um, was a little limited in what we'd hoped it would originally do. Um, many of the seafarers who couldn't join their ships were stuck at home off pay with often very little financial aid that other workers did have access to. Uh, the truth is that many of the problems faced were not actually created by the pandemic, but were um, exacerbated by it. Many seafarers, when they did actually get home, decided that the industry was no longer for them and they left. Because of these issues, many seafarers are questioning whether they want to continue in a career with the industry after such a profound financial and well-being toll taken. And despite our ongoing reliance on seafarers, oh, and the proud history of the Merchant Navy. In the last 40 years, British officers have fallen by around two thirds. And consistent under recruitment means the total is predicted to fall by another 30% within the next decade. I'm a careers at sea ambassador. I used to go around schools talking to school children about the Merchant Navy as a potential career option. Of course, in our minds, the most recent experiences we have have been very, very difficult for seafarers. And that makes me question, should we really be encouraging children into a career that can be very difficult and quite hard to do? So any plan to recover from the impact of the pandemic and tackle the enduring skills and issues that the industry has must be person-centred and it must be fair. Nautilus has launched a Build Back Fader campaign. I won't go through everything today, but I just want to highlight a couple of important issues so that our sector can realise the potential it has to offer and the net zero goal. There's something that we call sea blindness, which is a lack of awareness among the public the media and politicians as well. It impacts the ability of maritime to attract investment and it makes it more difficult to recruit the next generation of UK seafarers. In a new public survey of 2,000 people commit, commissioned by Nautilus, we found that sea blindness is a very real phenomenon. The full results will be published in a new white paper in the future but the initial results should worry everybody at the forum. Just 4% of the UK population had said they'd heard about or even discussed a prospect of a career at sea when they were at school and college. 
The result of this is only about 5% said they would even consider taking up a job in the maritime industry, not even at sea. The consequences are obvious when we consider the falling number of UK seafarers I mentioned earlier. Secondly, I'd like to talk about fair access to quality jobs and training opportunities in the future. We witnessed very recently the devastating impact caused by the shortage of HGV drivers, which had a potential impact across the entire economy. The impact would be even more profound if similar issues were to occur among seafarers. So the government must develop proactive policies to maximise the employment of British seafarers in the UK and equip them with the skills required to take advantage of the future opportunities for net zero. One key measure that would assist in achieving this goal would be the increased investment in the smart training scheme to cover 100% of the cost of training a UK resident seafarer and a requirement from the companies to guarantee a period of employment on completion of a cadetship. We all know that many employers require experience as well as qualifications. Mm -hmm. So a newly qualified cadet with no experience can find it very difficult to actually get a job and this would help. The focus of the UK government and the maritime industry should be to create high value work which the current workforce can benefit from. One of the things that, that could involve is British seafarers and professionals being able to enjoy or benefit from new job opportunities created in the decommissioning of offshore oil rigs, an industry that's worth 48 billion by recent estimates. As I mentioned, I'm a second engineer with 20 years experience. Way back when I was a cadet, there was no net zero. We learned about steam turbines, two-stroke and four-stroke diesel engines. Batteries were covered in about an hour. During my recent management course to become a chief engineer, we had a few hours on LNG diesel engines, scrubbers and NOx reducing systems. It's obviously difficult for the colleges because they are working to an MCA SDCW approved syllabus. And I can understand that they don't want to go outside of that syllabus to cover new technologies. But to date, additional training in modern technology is very limited and it's very expensive. You're looking at a thousand pound of training costs for some of these systems. If you're a seafarer who's never worked with a company that has these types of systems, then you won't have experience and you don't have training. So how do you get those skills? I want to have a quick look at a couple of examples of training courses. Since I became an engineer, diesel electric has become a more common propulsion system than it was then. But there's no MCA requirement for any type of formal training to sail on these ships. There are diesel electric operator courses available. They cost about a thousand pound for five days. There's also an LNG fuel training course available, which covers the handling of LNG and its risks. Again, this is nearly a thousand pound for a two day course. As a second engineer paying UK tax, one of those courses accounts for nearly a third of my monthly salary. In a recent poll that I did do before we arrived, I asked seafarers what they saw as the greatest challenge in retraining. And the majority answer was cost. We also need to better align cadet training and subsequent in-work training in these new technologies, alternative fuels and gas engines, battery and solar systems, hybrid systems, sail, rotor sail and sky kites and anything else that's currently being looked at. Nautilus would like to see a commitment from industry and from government to help fund the retraining of Merchant Navy officers who may miss out on these skills because we went through our cadetships when they were never available. In future, as these technologies develop, it may become more important for system specific training to be made available. And Nautilus would urge industry and government support for this. During the pandemic, an emergency bursary was set up 
by maritime charities with help from Nautilus to help seafarers who'd lost work due to COVID-19 get back into employment by funding training of up to £500 per seafarer. We'd welcome a similar and expanded programme funding by government for the transition to net zero. We really shouldn't be relying on charities to train our seafarers. We also need to think about the management of system specific training. A lot of engine manufacturers already run training courses for their own systems. But again, it's not an MCA requirement to have this training before sailing on board. But many of these training locations and the courses in general are very costly and it's prohibitive for engineers or deck officers to try and fund this themselves. As we move towards net zero and new technologies, one way to alleviate this would be for a link to be made between government funding of the maritime technology companies and training. We would ask simply that government uh, companies which have received government funding should be required to develop a training course available. It doesn't have to be in classroom, doesn't have to be face to face. It could be something very similar to what Seagull and Videotel courses are, which would allow seafarers to have some basic training on the new emerging technologies. There could be advanced senior officer courses that are not included in this requirement, which would be beneficial for all. Additionally, one of the other questions I asked before I arrived here was, did the seafarers companies currently pay for the SDCW safety training or not? And the result came back a 50-50 split. Um, I recently have had to pay for my own safety training refreshers. One of the things that could help with this is a UK flag linked suspended training scheme, similar to suspended meals or coffees. If a training is price pointed at company level, and let's be honest, companies tend to have deeper pockets than an individual seafarer and training companies base prices on these. If a company paid to retrain an employee in the move to net zero, the company pays an extra amount or a percentage to be put aside to train on an employed or a self-funding seafarer to run that same course, giving them the benefit of um, training. Again, with training providers in the UK, they could be encouraged to adapt or adopt a loyalty type system, where for say every 20 person that goes on the course, they set aside one place for free for an unemployed or self-funding seafarer. Given that the MCA have to uh, approve training providers and courses, it's possible that this could be put into the training or approval criteria. Finally, as the UK seeks to develop its offshore wind farms with an announcement of another 160 million in government funding, we would like to see an end to the visa waiver system, which has allowed the import of cheap labour to work in this sector. The government talks about levelling up and building back better. Well, let's build back fairer and ensure that the investment comes with the commitment to good quality jobs for a highly skilled Merchant Navy workforce. I hope that this will give some food for thought for the discussion that we're about to have. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. I'm sure it will. And uh, thanks, everybody. And thanks, Alan, there for giving a slightly different perspective in terms of our move to uh, to net zero. The um, you mentioned there about cadet uh, education, and we have, as a commission, done a very substantial review of officer cadet uh, education, and that work is now ongoing. But if anybody wants to know more about it, all the details of that are on our website. So I'd encourage you to to look at that and see uh, how that work is progressing. But let's move on to uh, having a, a Q and A and a discussion with regard to uh, what we've heard today. And we, you know, again, this is the opportunity for colleagues both in the virtual audience and here to put forward your views and perspectives. Just in terms of what we've heard there, I think one of the things that is clear that uh, as we look to move towards uh, a more uh, green approach, uh, green economy, I think was one of the terms that, that, that colleagues used, 
the skills needs relating to those are clearly apparent. So we're going to have to do something. And we all our colleagues have talked about the importance of collaboration between education providers, trainers, and of course, uh, uh, business. I, I was taken, Paul, by your classification of uh, the uh, jobs required for, for, for green. Green by nature, green by purpose, I think you said. The engagement piece, that bit about communicating the importance of this. And I think that ties up with the comments that uh, uh, Ian and David made about the cultural piece and getting everybody on side. And one of the things that will drive many education providers, I think, down the, the, the green route will be that the students who are coming into them are more and more aware of the importance of environmental uh, sustainability issues. And they will force us in universities and colleges to, to do something different. And I think that will happen amongst our workforces as well, won't it? But it's getting that combined culture and desire to make change that will help things. I think, Paul, you also summed up this afternoon really nicely about the conversation enabling the MSc to promote a guide to have a roadmap that will take us forward. And certainly one of the things I, we need to be clear about, the MSc, the Maritime Skills Commission, doesn't have the resource or the ability to deliver this beyond it um, helping to inform and that promote that guide, lead on that communication and all the things you've said is very much the place that we will see ourselves in, I think. I think we're also taken by the fact that clearly there are so many unknowns. And I don't know how many of you in the audience have ad adopted electric vehicles or whatever, but I, I hear the early adopters and I listen with interest to some of their stories and the challenge of going on a longer journey and whether you can plug in and all of this sort of stuff. Uh, it, and that will be the same at a much, much bigger scale, won't it, in business and industry in terms of that early adoption. But fascinating to hear from people who have, have tried it and, and gone down that line. And that importance of transferability. And I was talking uh, with one of my commissioner colleagues at lunchtime, and we were talking about, well, this reskilling, re retraining, how different is it now in context of the development of a green economy? Because skills and uh, abilities and requirements have evolved constantly, haven't they? One of the things that the cadet review states that we're, uh, you know, in, in terms of seafaring, the, the change that's about to come is almost as profound as the change from uh, sail to steam. But we managed that. And so that, you know, some lessons to be learned, I'm sure, in terms of that evolution of skills and where can we pick up skills and transfer them? So in a previous uh, role, I was the uh, National Skills Research Director for the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority. And similar to some of the stories we've heard here, aging workforce, people coming to the end, that was one of the biggest challenges we had when there was that sort of nuclear renaissance and you know, that has ebbed and flowed, I guess, over the last few years, but we're back talking about uh, more nuclear power. But where do we get those people from? And how did we upskill, reskill there? So that transferability, and Alan, you're uh, transferring that you're, you're, you're learning from oil and gas into, into shipbuilding and seafaring, really, really important, I think. The aging workforce, I take that as one of, as one of the biggest challenges. Uh, we need to, I mean, there's a general need, isn't there, in technical subjects to bring more people into it at an earlier age. And clearly we've got the uh, importance of making sure that we're getting um, people from all walks of life and all backgrounds interested in these careers. Um, you may, made the point, Alan, I was taken by that in terms of your location of your sites in some quite deprived areas. And we know that coastal communities have particular challenges, don't we? So if we are dealing with the green skills, green jobs issue, and we do it right, actually we can make a big impact on some of the other social and environment, uh, uh, sorry, social and cultural uh, elements as well as the environmental. And I think that's something that, that we should take on board uh, and, and heed as well. Very much take the point about the importance of collaboration, uh, partnerships, education and business, absolutely right. And that's why we try uh, on the commission to get a real balance of representation from across the sector, but people coming in from all different uh, elements of that. So we can encourage and develop that collaboration. And I'm left, I think, with uh, a particular issue that we face. And of course, this is not unique to this, but it is something which is very, very apparent. And we've heard a lot about it. Uh, you, Paul, you talked about the importance of the investment in infrastructure. Uh, you know, just taking the, the simple electric car uh, example again, how many stories do we hear about somebody pulling up and not actually being able to get, to get charged because there isn't the, the number of, of charging sites. So the infrastructure at a very basic level as well as infrastructure at a very complex level, 
but it's going to need investment and it's going to need funding. And the question that Alan was raising there about funding and how do we support people to transfer and update and take their skills across and whose responsibility is it? And we have that debate around education and training all the time, don't we? Is it the individual? Is it the state? Uh, where does the uh, balance uh, sit? And what responsibility is there on the taxpayer to enable all of this to happen? So uh, what we, we knew was this is a very complex situation. And I think the um, presentations that we've had from colleagues have just reinforced that. This is complex. There's no easy answer to this. And that's why we need sessions like this to help inform us so that we can have that debate and come up with a position um, that uh, uh, we can uh, share uh, more widely, get people on the same page in terms of this development. Now, we're going to uh, go over now to uh, the panel, ask the questions that have been put, put through. There's only five of them. And then I'll open it up and really welcome comments from uh, particularly fellow commissioners, but everybody uh, here in the, uh, the various audiences. Now, um, if you are here and you are one of the people who submitted one of these questions, please do uh, make yourself known. And also, if you want it directed uh, at a particular member of the panel, but otherwise I'll invite all of the panelists to, to comment on this. So one of the questions we've had in, um, can the maritime sector learn from or even collaborate with other safety critical industries? Maybe this is already being considered, for example, with the energy sector, oil and gas and renewables, and has similar challenges uh, and just about to embark on similar research on reskilling. Sorry, that, that's me not reading that quite clearly. But anyway, can the maritime sector learn from or even collaborate with other safety critical industries? And obviously, Alan, I'm gonna start with you. <laughs> The answer is obviously yes. Um, I outlined it when I spoke earlier. Um, I think that there is a offshore spine through all of that, obviously. Um, I think that renewables was probably an arrogant industry in maybe three or four or five years ago, but it thought that oil and gas, uh, anyone that's coming in to the industry from oil and gas, what did they know? Renewables knows best. I think they're waking up to the fact that technology and innovation and cost transformation has been around for 20, 30 years in oil and gas, and that's now been embraced, particularly as the floating agenda uh, grows. So I think industries are starting to wake up and understand that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the it's an obvious response to that, Graham, to be honest, yeah. there's, uh, there's so much potential. Yeah. I think the, the, the cost transformation side, and I don't want to touch on cost too much, but you know, these industries are all about, you know, maximizing UK content irrespective of what sector you're in. Um, but to be com to be competitive, it's around being efficient and being cost competitive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that lends itself to, you know, the oil and gas is an example yeah. that's learned a lot of lessons over the last 20 years. Yeah. And, and clearly, safety critical industries have got to make this investment. They've got to progress. And, and even some of those traditional engineering relying on oil and gas as well and the, the significant amount of research into the combustion engine that has reduced emissions etc cetera, etc cetera. there's really good work going on there that we should capture shouldn't we if we can yeah i mean there was a the conversation over lunch that um there are process safety intensive industries i mentioned oil and gas before but um the systems and processes are fairly robust and fairly bureaucratic but it's the behaviors Back to the cultural side again, it's the, the, the kind of decision making and behaviours of individuals within that construct that really makes the difference. Yeah, thanks. And Ian and David, you, you were both talking really about being importers, weren't you, of uh, skills and technology. So, you know, how can you learn or collaborate with other safety critical industries? Well, I think coming from a transport sector, I think we um, have, have shared a lot from the aerospace sector and being in Belfast yeah. is a um, one of the real advantages is the crossover with the um, aircraft industry and i think i think one of the things that green um, solutions require is new technologies and often innovative often um, new materials and um, to basically increase efficiencies is, is what we're trying to do with our in the vehicle sense and um, aerospace in some ways have been obviously very safety critical and also needing because it has to be in the air uh, <laughs> needing to be so and also needing to embrace some of these new technologies like composites and so for us a lot of our work has been with um, classification societies and the mca trying to talk about how we can adopt some of the aerospace regulation and along with that the materials and the skills required to deal with those materials in this sector so i think that within the transport world there's a lot of crossover yeah. 
of the skills. In terms of the importing, I think I think I think it's 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 you know there's a lot of talk about that in the media at the moment. My experience of importing skills or retraining skills, my experience is a bit different in that I would have set up a, a team in a, a lot of different countries around the world, and so got quite used to quite almost lazy of importing groups of people. And there was, um, I think, what I found really satisfying about basing yourself is that ability to grow your own um, skills and talent pool. So working with a shout out to Belfast Met College, for example, who is just a fantastic organization in Belfast who working on our apprentice course together. And actually on a positive front, someone who wasn't aware of these opportunities, I found it almost amazing. You know, you're working with this hugely motivated organization with us, also hugely motivated to train people, trying to develop skills specific for our needs. And I'm thinking, People do this. Oh, great. Um, so I, I've been really excited by the opportunities that are out there. Um, so, yeah, certainly don't think we've necessarily, um, I think we're quite lucky in Belfast. Maybe we're not, but I, I think it's, we've been really excited by the ability to train in new, new skills. Yeah. Thanks. Well, a great, great uh, illustration of that uh, collaboration between business and colleges. And I think you, you, you are lucky in Belfast, I'm sure, but I think there are very high quality colleges and universities actually all over the UK. And that's one of the things we're blessed with. We have a very strong education sector. And I think actually that that sector will step up to the challenge as well. So uh, so that's fantastic. Thank you. Alan, Paul, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I guess just again, it's a yes, of course, we can learn from other industries. Um, possibly a good example is um, airline flight crews. They have to go through type specific ratings for any aircraft that they fly. Um, it's not a case of once you've got the license, off you go, fly whatever you want. So they're constantly retraining and reskilling as pilots. And there's probably lessons in there to be learned. Whether we would go through the same route or not is something that needs to be considered because the lessons aren't just what works what didn't work yeah. as well is just as important a point. Yeah, I think that link between different forms of transport that's already been made, particularly aerospace, but I, I was involved in educating um, uh, people involved uh, or going into the maritime industry in the past. And some of the people in composites or in design ended up working in Formula One because of the skills that they had and they were very, very transferable. And of course, an awful lot of the Formula One companies and their investments that they're putting in their innovations, they're looking to roll those out, aren't they, to make a return, putting them into other industries as well. So we've just got to, one of the things you know, is, is, is signposting this, isn't it? How do we pick up on all of that's going on, Paul? Well, I was just going to add that none of us have got a monopoly on good ideas and we can all learn from each other. Uh, I learned a long time ago in my career that collaboration leads to innovation. So by working together, we can come up with the new ideas for the future. And we don't have time to reinvent the wheel. So we need to get the best of what's out there now, uh, whilst we're moving forward on developing the new, the new skills that we need as well. Thanks, Paul. While you've got the mic, the second question, is there a need for a common definition or understanding of green skills in the maritime industry? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, uh, Orally and I made an attempt to give our definition. Um, and I think actually this is a role for the position paper for the uh, Maritime Skills Commission to define what is this thing called green skills and how are we going to own it and shape it? Thanks. Colleagues? Well, I'd probably say they're not exclusive to maritime. You know, we're working with high voltage battery systems, um, similar to, you know, right, right bus is uh, also from, from Belfast as well. And we're currently setting up a training course for people that are going to be involved in those processes and installing them on vessels, et cetera. And, you know, we're, we're taking those skills from automotive and perhaps there's opportunities to maybe share courses with other industries where there are similar things. Um, we've actually, you know, it's been hard actually to try and find the right instructors um, the safety instructors on the high voltage battery systems and it's a bit of a challenge so I think there definitely needs to be more instructors more people out there who have these relevant skills from you know potentially maybe you've been working in F1 or, or other industries that are leading in certain areas because um, that would certainly certainly help us grow fast and keep people safe. Thank you I wonder one of the questions is whether or not they're green skills or skills for green jobs and, and subtly different, I think, but um, probably quite important in terms of definition. I think you just said what I was trying to say, but more, more succinctly, so <laughs> exactly. yes, exactly that. Thanks. Okay. Alan's? 
Um, yeah, again, but you say one word or two words, green skills, but that really doesn't convey the magnitude of the skills that are going to be required. Um, so yeah, some definitions around what those are, <laughs> it's going to be um, a requirement. And that's probably going to be part of the pathway that you talked about developing uh, is maybe where that can be fleshed out and diversified a bit more. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, um, this, I think it's a spider's web um, to try and cut through and understand better. I think customers within the markets that, for example, we serve, their needs and demands are changing constantly. And that rate of change is, is fairly high. Um, so understanding what that means in the context of what skills you require to execute that work is uh, it's a challenge. Thanks, Alan. Again, while you've got the, the, the mic, you mentioned about apprenticeships and your pleasure at the bringing on so many uh, fantastic schemes. So well done. Um, but what changes do you think need to be made to apprenticeships to incorporate green skills? I guess that drops down from the other question. It's a challenging one because is it a green skill or is it a skill for a green job? But what do you think? It's a difficult question to answer. I mean, I think the, the previous point needs to be made clearer to better understand that. But I made the point in my, my update earlier that, you know, looking in, looking ahead, it's um, how do you, you know, you, you, you baseline the understanding of the kind of talent pool that as an organisation you're looking to bring on board and the apprentices that support that. How do you make that clear in terms of the type of skills, the type of, um, you know, the, the sectors and within the, within the markets that you're operating in where they fit? Um, but yeah, it's a, there's no silver bullet to that question, sadly. No, no, sure. Alan, do you have a perspective? Um, again, I kind of come back to uh, the thing I mentioned during my talk was that smart funding and boosting that up uh, above the level it is to make those apprenticeships or those cadetships uh, more available. Um, as for actual changes inside the cadetship programmes, that's partly going to cascade down from the technologies that become available but we maybe have to look at changing the syllabus faster than it has been done in the past so that instead of a more formal lecture on the emerging technologies it's more of a informal discussion about potentials and you know, what might be in the future rather than this is a gas engine, you'll find one on a ship, it does this, you need to do this to maintain it. And more of a discussion amongst the lecturers and the cadets themselves about what they might find in the future. A more responsive and flexible curriculum, I think you're arguing for there, aren't you, in some ways, and an ability to change it more rapidly than we have been yeah. in the past. Yeah, yeah agreed. Paul? Yeah, I think there's several things that we need to be doing at the same time. Um, we've got to identify the new job roles in the emerging sectors and prepare the apprenticeships now for those. Uh, so we've got to think ahead. Um, so it could be that we need apprenticeships for, you know, programming autonomous vessels or something. You know, that's the thinking that we need to be doing now. Um, we need to add green credentials to existing training, and that needs to be immediate. Um, we need to add carbon awareness uh, to existing curriculum as well, so that you know we're we're spreading the word and getting everybody to buy into this. Um, and one of the examples that I gave earlier, um, which is tackling the problem a different way around, is having employer-based training centres in communities and coastal towns, for example, uh, to cut down the need for travel. Mm. Um, so it's addressing the carbon issue, but it's also promoting the right skills where they're needed. And argu arguably, I guess that carbon awareness, you're not talking about that just in programs that are leading to, uh, that's across everything, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I was just going to add that, I mean, the point that Alan made about the lack of interest and maybe appetite in apprentices or young people, school leavers on the seafaring side, I think we'll all agree, most of us have got the kids in the room that without an Xbox or a PlayStation, you know, kids are lost at the moment. And certainly in our business, attracting people that leave school that want to come into a ship repairing conversion environment, as an example, is a challenge. Yeah. It's just not seen as a, an, an, an appealing career. Yeah. So it's, it's probably linked to what we're talking about, how you make that 
how you sell that in a better yeah. way. And I think there are actually people in the audience because I've had the opportunity to talk to them who have got a really interesting ideas in terms of how we make it more attractive and how we uh, appeal to people and bring them in. And also the fact that, I mean, Paul, you made the point that we, we, you know, we don't have a career for life, we have a life of careers. Actually, it's about ensuring that, that uh, people who go to sea and have a great career there have also the opportunity and the skill set to come back and then do something else. That transferability, why can't they turn up and manage and lead and do other things as well? So I'm sure that flexibility is important. Do you want to add anything to that, David or Ian? I just, I mean, that, one of the, the attractiveness aspect, I do think my, again, from my experience of travel, we, we're not the best in this country at, um, applying equal status to the mm -hmm. different levels of skills. And I, I, I find it a real shame, I must say. And I've ended up dealing in the world with, on the boat building side a lot with Kiwis because the skill level is really high. They have serious self-esteem for their skills. They, they are, their, their input to design is respected and we become a real collaborative team between all the aspects of building a vessel. And I don't think we do that enough here, frankly, and certainly the teams I'm part of, I'll stamp hard on that kind of culture where people try to say, here's the design, now make it. Um, and it's, uh, but it's slightly the way we are sometimes here, and I don't know why, but it's something we have to be really careful of because it means we're not as good for a start. We don't make as good of things and it's not as pleasurable place to work. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? It comes back to that cultural piece again, doesn't it, really, and getting the right culture. So the culture in terms of everybody being on board in terms of, you know, we need to make a change, but then how we make that change, they have to all buy into that. It's sort of a, a united approach, really. Yeah, thank you. Now, the, the, the final question I've got on, on this list uh, uh, before we open up, yeah, I think the people who set the question are probably in the audience. Do, 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 you, do you want to, Dieter or Kevin, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, yeah, there's um, a microphone. Uh, and uh, just so people are aware, that will be held by an MUK colleague so it doesn't need to be wiped down all the time. So. Uh, DT Yannick, uh, I'm a uh, trustee of Brit Britannia Maritime Aid. Our um, goal, and it comes to all the people on the, uh, on the podium here, was to set a platform for training green platform and we are currently looking to build a training vessel and the question was really to everybody do they see the value of a training vessel um, with green credentials um, which becomes part of a, a disaster relief package uh, a very sustainable and versatile platform as something we should be doing in the UK not only to promote the UK industry but to help the uh, people globally. So it's not something just for us, it's for, for the world. And we call it a vessel for our planet. So is that something that the, the panel feels that we should be moving forward with? Because we're, we're doing this, we're having a go at it, we're finding a real challenge. And there is a lot of sea blindness, political blindness is this sort of thing. But yeah, that's the question. So Graham, there you are, there you are. That's, no, uh, thanks, thanks, Dieter. Quickly. It's a, it's a tough question. I'm sure there's- Quickly, it's in the, in the main forum, if you want to come out in the, in the foyer to come yeah. and look at it later on, yeah? Okay, so there's a model there if, if colleagues want to go and see it. But we'll start with you, Alan. What do you think about that? A, a cadet uh, training vessel? Um, I definitely think uh, a training vessel would be worthwhile. Uh, I certainly know that other countries such as Poland uh, actually have cadet training vessels. And I think it's because it's when you're on board, it's, your training is very much dependent upon the officers on board. You have your cadet book. Um, to work through with your various tasks, but you have to actually be able to do those tasks. Um, and on a commercial ship, depending on the senior officers, they may or may not be interested in doing that. Um, you can come back to college and certain tasks can be done in the workshop or in the simulators that the colleges have. But of course, a simulator is a simulator. Um, so a cadet training ship with you know, conference facilities, classroom facilities, and actual dedicated people to carry out and help with your training is definitely going to be beneficial to the cadets as they progress through. Thanks, Alan. Any other views, uh, panellists? Maybe slightly outside of your bailiwicks? Uh, no? Well, uh, Paul and Alan. I would just say selfish. That's a fantastic idea, so we'd like to build it for you. <laughs> yeah, that's very good. Yeah, Paul? 
Uh, yeah, it sounds a fantastic idea. I volunteered the fact that I know nothing about cadet training. Um, but what we are doing in Falmouth um, is building the relationship with Royal Fleet Auxiliary uh, in the Port of Falmouth. And they have cadets and they're interested to learn from the model that Cornwall Marine Network has adopted with our Marine Academy, which engages young people in careers advice for the sector uh, and prepares them for jobs in the industry. Um, because they're struggling to get quality cadets in. And also, I'm interested to build the relationship later for when people are retiring from the Navy to get them jobs because they're experienced people, um, skilled people, get them jobs in industry. So we are having conversations as to how we can narrow those gaps. Yeah, It's again, utilizing their skills and experiences in, in different ways and providing that up, upskilling, reskilling, training, et cetera. Yeah. No, I think, you know, obviously, like we, we would obviously love to have one of our zero mission daughter craft on board the boat and, you know, use, use that as a, an opportunity not only to train the cadets on board in terms of electric propulsion systems, high voltage battery systems, etc, but potentially use it as a way to train people internationally, you know, if we're trying to generate technologies, innovations here, um, we want to exp export that technology, uh, create more jobs here. And we need to train people around the world to use this new technology. So it could, you know, it could be an interesting way to provide that platform. Okay, there you go. I think there's support there, uh, Dieter. Obviously, uh, many more questions will arise as a, uh, relating to it and, and the concept of it. But I'm sure that uh, colleagues will be interested in having those conversations. So, so thank you. Yeah. Um, just a small opinion. We should stop bashing ourselves because a lot of people in this room are very passionate about new ventures and about. Um, getting people to see. So there are a lot of young people that are aware of what's going to see. And we talk about, you know, there are people not aware of what's out there, but we as a group, and I know there are other people in here, work closely with schools. And there are a lot of young people out there would like to go to see. But at the moment, the cadet program doesn't allow that because maybe the qualification is not right. So maybe we should have a look at how we, the, how we bring these young people into our, into our, um, industry so we maybe look at should look at that as well because as i say there are a lot of people we miss and leave behind because they may not be ready at the time we want them and they could be late, ready later on so i think we should stop bashing ourselves because there are a lot of people around that are very passionate about getting the industry forward and i think we as a as a group do quite well actually we may not do what everybody wants us to do and it may not uh, fulfill the goals of everything but i think we do a really really good job and i'd like to thank those people in this room including the people on the podium that do a really good job about what we're trying to achieve. So let's not bash ourselves all the time. No, th thank you, Dieter. I think that's a message that, that's well received, uh, that we do things really well. And actually, one of the uh, objectives of the Maritime Skills Commission is to increase uh, exports. And uh, that's in recognition of the very high quality of uh, education and training that takes place in the UK. And we can deliver that either in the UK or indeed in, in country. So, uh, so yeah, I think we should, uh, we should be very aware of that. So thank you. Okay, now um, we can move to questions from the audience and from the virtual audience. And the virtual audience are slightly ahead of the game here because they've indicated that they want to uh, uh, ask some questions. Yep. Right. Right, Ian McKinnon, if you want to take yourself off mute, please. Can we hear you in? Can, can you hear me? Yes. You can, yes. It, it's a question primarily for um, Artemis and for Harland and Wolf, um, because the tense is different. You're currently recruiting apprentices. You recently recruited apprentices. And in a very few years time, they're going to need skills which you can't yet define. And I wondered how you're getting on with that. What are you doing? How are you preparing them? Okay, well, uh, thanks for that question. I, th I think the, um, I think, it is an interesting point where where the technologies will go drives where the skills will go. I'd say one of the things that as a company is our ethos is always trying to use digital twinning to understand where the technologies are going. Having models that are flexible, have as high fidelity as appropriate to understand where technologies are going from a business sense and also from a technology sense, we can try and be proactive about where the skills are going and our courses are as such. But I think the point earlier that one of the required skills being critical thinking and creativity is very, very important because we need to have training courses that aren't as rigid. That's, you know, I think it was touched on before as well. 
about on board the vessels, but we need to have training schemes that yes, for us, we have some specific needs that we are confident for our modeling is appropriate for the next 10 years, but you're right. You know, will it be appropriate for the next 30 for the career of those individuals we're training now? So the one skill that will be appropriate is that creativity and collaborative attitude. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, as I mentioned, we are just over 20 months into our journey. So it's very early stage for us. The, the kind of trade related apprenticeship program is what we've kicked off this year. There are technical and business support apprenticeships that are in the pipeline. Um, but uh, the very kind of straightforward answer is it's very early stage for us. It's the, the key thing for us was to, to mitigate the impact of an aging workforce and the attrition rate that we face was to really look at the trades um, and that's what we've done to the tune of 34, as I said, which is, you know, is a, a very high percentage of what we have in, uh, from a workforce perspective. Um, but it's something that we're keen from a collaborative point of view to learn from and how we, how we do that. Thanks, Alan. Should, I should have mentioned Ian is one of our uh, commissioners. So thank you for that, Ian. Um, and I just wanted just to follow up on that, on that question, because uh, I think um, you were mentioning about uh, the challenge of not knowing what you'll need in the future, but you know what you need now and you're employing on that basis and then you can make them evolve with it? Yeah, I think I think from our perspective, we we knew that there were certain skills locally that didn't exist. So we've had to, you know, effectively import those skills from around the world. Um, but we have, we have a, I, we, we call it our innovation roadmap for the next sort of five years laid out. And we actually had to go to the college and ask them to work with us to create a cur curriculum specific to our requirements. And I would encourage other businesses to do the same. Um, there wasn't a course there that was available. Um, and unless we kind of reached out to the college and drove that, nothing would have happened. So I think that's just a point to make. We, it's as people have said, you know, not everyone's gonna have the same requirements. So if you do have a specific requirement, just try and speak to your local college and see whether they can help. Because when we found they've been, you know, incredibly supportive for our requirements. Great, great advert for the colleges. So, so thank you for that. But I think as we go more into the green uh, jobs piece and the green skills, and the less we know, colleges and universities and training providers are going to rely more on businesses coming in and saying, we need somebody to do this, and then they need to put in place the innovation to create it. Yeah, and I think it's not just apprenticeships. As I said before, you know, the road to net zero is going to be constantly evolving. So we just need to be agile and not just you know, training apprentices. We need to be training our staff, our staff members, our heads of department. They need to understand the new technologies. They need to be aware of what's happening, what the universities are doing, um, not just you know in the UK, but around the world. Because it's a competitive global marketplace there, and we want to be the, the forefront of that. Thank you. I think that fits very, very well with what you were saying, Paul, as well about that sort of the general need for us to be introducing all of these things into uh, the courses that we do and the work that we're doing. So people are very aware of the importance of that innovation and that technology, as well as the, the, the issues around carbon, et cetera. Absolutely. And I, I think the key theme there was that the training needs to be what the employers need. Um, too often in the past, government funding for training uh, dictates what training businesses can receive. Uh, we need the employers to be saying the training that they need and the system needs to deliver on that. Um, so government funding for training is um, out of date and needs a major overhaul. The whole system isn't working. Yeah, sure. And, and of course, a lot of work going on around that at the moment, isn't there, in terms of uh, both FE and HE, but it'd be interesting to see how that uh, pans out. So thank you. Your colleague, Paul Orally is online and she would uh, like to comment. Uh, Orally, do you want to come off mute? Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Good. Uh, thanks, everyone, for great presentations. I just wanted to react to um, Alan's presentation. Um, Alan, you talked about the, the need to create um, high value work. And I think it's important that we differentiate between secure green jobs and also insecure gig jobs, um, including zero hour contracts, agency and, and temporary work. Um, you talked about the difficulty to attract young people into marine careers and young people are likely to turn their back um, on green jobs if employment opportunities take the form of insecure contracts and, and uncertain earnings as well. So we need to think really about the type of, of green jobs that we want as a sector. And linked to that, I saw as well a comment from uh, Amiria uh, Macbeth about women being underrepresented in the marine sector and the fact that the pandemic um, has increased inequalities in, in the workplace. 
And really, I think the net zero transition goes hand in hand with um, greater equality. And we need the role of women as agents of change to be more widely recognized at all levels, as decision makers, as experts, and in all types of roles. And I don't know if you've seen the um, Region Southwest campaign, the digital campaign that they launched this week, which is called um, Faces of the Energy Transition, and they showcase specifically women in different types of roles, um, in finance roles, in office-based roles, or in technician and engineering roles as well, all acting um, in their day-to-day -day job um, towards net zero. So I think that was a good example as well to illustrate what Paul was saying about the fact that green jobs are pretty much everywhere. And um, linked to that, uh, Graham, when you talked about um, the need to define green jobs, I think there's one concept that's quite interesting too, which is job greenification, uh, because it reflects the fact that it's um, the net zero transition is a process and the workforce will need to handle net zero projects in addition and then alongside um, uh, other conventional projects. So existing skills will need to be applied to new technologies and, and new situations, but where practical experience at the moment is currently limited because those new technologies, for example, hydrogen, haven't really been yet integrated in with existing industrial facilities. So a great deal of the training uh, will need to occur on the job. So the fact that really it's a process and we'll have um, existing jobs that will um, progressively become greener, I think it's it, it's important to acknowledge it's not jobs that will necessarily appear out of nowhere. Thanks, Orly. Really, really uh, helpful points. And I think the more the afternoon goes on, the more I'm thinking that we are really the, the language we should be using is green jobs more than green skills, isn't it? And there's a there's a skill element to underpin those green jobs, but it comes from a variety of different ways, etc. Orly, you also make a very good point about the importance of women uh, generally, I think, in terms of uh, having increased representation in technology and engineering. And one of the things that Christy and I are both very aware of is this is a somewhat male panel, isn't it? Um, and um, we were talking about that earlier and we're aware of it and we're conscious of it. And we do need to do more. And we know that we don't have enough women uh, in engineering and technology, et cetera. But we've got commissioners who are really passionate about that and I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll want to comment as we go through, which leads us into um, uh, introducing another commissioner, Karen Walton, uh, who does specialize in people skills. So Karen. Hi, Graham, thanks very much indeed. I don't know if everyone can hear me. Um, yeah, really, thank you everyone to the uh, to the panelists for uh, a really good um, set of presentations and a number of things. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to highlight was um, to comment on, but also just to, um, I suppose, make the link. The com I, I would agree, first of all, that it is green jobs and not green skills. Um, I think with the skills, that it, it really is, those can be um, looked at what those are. Uh, but I think it is a question of the of green jobs and what are we doing from a green jobs point of view. Um, but there were several people made different comments in terms of the um, behaviours. And one of the things we're doing, obviously, as the commission is where, um, where we, Graham, you said at the start, the um, the green theme runs through that, through our work. Um, behaviours has come out, behaviours and, and soft skills has come out as something which can we pinpoint, can we, you know, what, what can we actually say, see? Um, and that's some work we're doing now in a, in a particularly different um, working group. But I think picking up on some of the comments that people make, things like creativity, um, visionary um, elements, um, culture's huge. Um, it, is, it is related to behaviours, people's attitudes. Um, and this isn't an area that's easy to, um, to perhaps address. And I think one of the things that the, the maritime industry at the moment is, is um, perhaps needs to, to think about more seriously is where other sectors are looking at uh, behavior development with behaviorists and not necessarily technical people who um, look to do say leadership or management because behaviors take time to change and they need to be developed. Um, and I think it's just having a deeper understanding, but. I mean, I made notes along the way about the culture, the safety culture, cultural, um, generally problem solving, decision making. You can't just go on a course and say, I didn't know it yesterday. I know it today. Um, it's your it's a mindset, critical thinking, um, uh, communication generally. And I think one of the biggest things is as well is change management. Our 
our mindsets as to as to how how prepared people are um, to want to change. Um, and I can't remember who made the comment, but someone made the comment about you know how do we bring everyone up to speed now, let alone cope with the um, the increasing rate of change that's happening around us. And that's that's people's attitudes um, and their, their behaviours generally. Um, and the final point I just wanted to make when it's just come up on the last point you were saying there, when it was uh, we talk about planning um, and wearing a my HR hat professionally, uh, workforce planning is something which we really, really could be better at. And I love the fact that Artemis is saying, you know, go to other providers and ask them for some help, because that is the way of doing it. It is saying we've recognised we haven't got the answers. How can we make it, make it happen? How can you help us? But in the, for, in the forefront, you've got to have that attitude and that willingness um, and the, um, uh, again, the culture to want to change and make that happen and not still live in the past. So, yeah, behaviours is a real, a real factor that we're really you know, looking at, but trying to unpick it as well. So, um, thank, thank you. you. Aaron. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you. Colleagues, do you, anybody want to comment on that? Um, just while we're thinking about that, the, um, please do put your hand up in the audience if you've got a question and we'll come to you. So I'll come to colleagues uh, shortly. We'll just go to uh, Amira Macbeth, uh, who wants to just talk a little bit about women and diversity. And then we'll go the three colleagues at the back and, and, uh, and Colin at the front here. Thank you. Amira. Hi, everybody. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invite. Um, very interesting discussion. So uh, it's, yeah, it's been very interesting to listen. I just got a question for Alan D. Um, about the diversity. Uh, so Alan was saying that the workforce development in, needs to be a fair and person centered transition. Um, but there's a big group who's missing out and that's women. And we've seen that highlighted in the pandemic as well. Um, and we also need high value jobs and purposeful work um, as well as men. So there's a huge pipeline of talent that's missing out. And how can these green skills change to include everybody, including women, as opposed to what's already been done in the past with, for example, oil and gas, which is predominantly male dominated. Does anyone have any ideas about that? Okay, well, I think a good place to start would be with the two Alans, if they're happy to answer that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a fantastic point, and it is um, something that the maritime industry and uh, the engineer profession in general is, uh, is struggling with. Um, it's a slow change that's been going on. Um, there are a number of new initiatives uh, running through looking to um, diversify the recruitment um, process and the um, sectors of the population that, that we're actually making contact uh, with and promoting the jobs too. Um, female role models is probably one of the best ways um, to improve that and uh, role models from minority communities as well. Um, it is obviously quite difficult as a career at sea ambassador, as a white male getting up in front of a group of students and then having some of the females in the class ask what it's like to be at sea. I can't answer that for them because I've never had the experiences that some of my seafaring female colleagues have had. So it's it is difficult and it's a challenge. And the work that is being done with careers at sea ambassadors and STEM ambassadors is changing that. And it is bringing in new initiatives where it's um, girls only careers fairs um, and various other initiatives. But I do believe it is probably those role models that will actually have the greatest impact and Sometimes it's not possible to pair up with um, a female seafarer or a seafarer from uh, a minority background, but there are certain things that, that can be done that we have maybe videos of them talking that we can put on during our careers presentation 
but yeah, it is it is a big struggle, and it's something that that still needs a lot of work to be done. And we need to start early, don't we, and get into the schools at a very early age and provide them with that. Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the big things. When we target, you know, 14, 15, 16-year-olds, generally a lot of them have already worked their way into maybe not a job, but certainly a, a sector that they're going for. So I think it's probably better. I know that uh, STEM ambassadors are targeting primary school mm. children where you've still got that, chance to actually have a significant impact to inform so that when they look at making a career choice in secondary school they're already aware of what's possible whereas late secondary school decisions are probably already made and you're then trying to change people's minds rather than just giving them the the information to make their own choice. Alan from your industry perspective yeah, I think two two points to the, the response. I think first of all, I mentioned we thirty four apprentices we brought in with over five hundred applicants across the four sites, of which about forty percent were female, um, at varying ages. I have to say, not all school leavers. Yeah. Um, so I thought it was really refreshing, yeah. um, because I think classic shipbuilding, sunset industry, male dominated. That's that, that's certainly starting to change that stereotype. If I lean in industries I know well, defence, oil and gas, renewables, offshore winds, an example, has got a strong female contingent, so there's no concern I wouldn't have there. Um, Defence, oil and gas, probably traditionally male-dominated, uh, irrespective of what, what, what part of that market you, you operate in. In my experience, is diversity and inclusion. Um, I've seen working groups across many companies that are KPI-driven, their business imperatives to an extent, um, and I, that those industries are definitely transforming. So I think, you know, the, the question that was raised, I think that's, that's an important point. But I think those industries are changing and recognise that. Yeah, and that's encouraging. Yeah, so great. Thank you very much. I think we'll turn some questions in the room. Um, so uh, colleague, we've got colleagues at the back there. Why don't we, um, why don't we ask, if, if you've got questions, should we take the four questions and then run around the panel and then come to colleagues at the front? Yeah, thanks, Graham. I'll be very quick. Uh, it's Richard Ballantyne uh, from the British Port Association. So we're the... National Association for Ports and Harbours representing almost 90% of uh, the ports that handle freight and and many, many more. So, Graham, it's probably a question to you and then maybe uh, one of your panel members to identify. You've touched on this a bit, but I was just wondering, what do you think the role of, uh, and given this is probably going out broadly, not just the UK, sort of to an international group as well, what do you think the role of government should be in supporting industry develop the green skills and you know the future skills strategy obviously you chair the commission i just wonder if you've got any thoughts if there's any responsibilities on government to do anything or should it be very much industry-led no, thanks for that we'll come to that yep so thank you thanks richard hi Kerry forster from the workboat association um i already put on a point earlier about the fact that um, within our industry both offshore but also onshore we're mainly a hands-on learning environment um, even after initial training as a, as a cadet, as we heard afterwards, you go through uh, onboard learning, you learn from the people around you. It's very hard to be able to do that when the people around us obviously haven't got the skill sets that we need to learn from. Um, but we've also mentioned that already uh, today. Um, we, we spoke earlier a little bit before this meeting about the fact that engineers will create by instinct. So engineers are creating this technology now. And seafarers are adaptable by their inherent uh, nature as well. They're adapting to change all the time. That's part of why they do their job. And that's why they're successful at sea. Um, We we said that we're looking at future fuels and we said, what's going to happen in the future? But I really want to stress the point that this is happening now. Um, We've got Ian and David up here, which are talking about a vessel which they're building now. We've got other vessels over the road, which are being, that are already built now. And and for my members, they're already operating these vessels. It's not future fuels. We're not even ready to regulate or train on today's fuels. And that's the problem we've got. And we need to realize that. Um, We're not looking at the future. We're looking at what's, what are we missing now and what are we doing? Um, We've just, in the last few years, we had the Clean Maritime Plan. It said by 2025, all vessels operating in UK waters are maximizing the use of energy efficient options. Zero emission commercial vessels are operated in UK waters. So we knew this already, and yet we still haven't done it. And this is really, you know, we need to do something today. My ask to the commission is, what's being done to look at the the gap? We know that people are ready to train. 
We've discussed that. We know that engineers are ready to create the technology. We've done that. We know that people are buying the vessels because they've bought them. Where is the where is the sticking point? And and really asked the commission, can you can you report on that or can you look into that to, to help us? Because if you know the answer is not always with governmental money. Um, you know we've got to look within the industry as a whole as well, and and we can only do that if if a group comes together and really pinpoints the issue that we've got at hand. Thank you for that. We note the question to the commission, but we'll also open it up to uh, panel members uh, when when we get there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barry McCooey, uh, ML Power Systems. We're marine diesel engine specialists, but how do we attract more top end engineers into the industry? Because we've mentioned here about costs, costs drive the world. We're all trying to drive costs down. And actually what we're doing is driving the good engineers out of our industry. I can name probably five top class engineers that make a hell of a good living flying around the world sorting out super yachts and they would be ideal people to go back into Harlem and Wolf and like that to train and skills because they're hands-on they are solutions engineers when you land on a super yacht you can't go ah I need that part it's not three week lead time you have to make the solution and you may need to make it today okay so how, how do we get these people back into the industry yeah because they're being dragged off by other industries so are paying more money and it's a sexier career to do this rather than to lie in a bilge of a boat and get covered in oil and grease. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Uh, we'll give the panel a bit of time to think about it. Um, Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Daniel, Head of Technical and Policy at the Institute of Marine Engineering, Science and Technology. Um, I just wanted to touch on culture, um, touch on schools, students and early careers br just briefly. Um, we talked about culture in the workplace, but um, I think the other thing employers can do is really instill a culture of professional development and like lifelong learning in their employees. So really valuing the opportunities, the focus on their career. You know, you, you can't just train and, and stay still. You have to keep learning. You have to keep doing things. And maybe there's a role. There are there are many professional bodies out there, but you know, really support and encourage your employees. Maybe through through paying their membership fees, for example, or at least in encouraging them to get involved. Um, just in terms of the 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 engaging with different age groups, um, the way we've tackled it or we're working on it within the IMRS is inspire, support, develop. So we're we're working with partners. We're working with our members to inspire school-aged children. Um, you touched on age groups. I think actually the earlier age groups have been shown seven to 11 is really when those passions get cemented. So we've been doing that with partners in ocean literacy and maybe STEM needs to move earlier um, to engage more broadly at that age group and then um, support students. So colleges like City of Glasgow, et cetera, they're already doing that in that they embrace accreditation, things like that. So they're recognizing the quality of the skills that they're trying to teach. Um, and then really it's about encouraging those early career developments. And maybe with green skills coming up, that's that's a green opportunity to inspire, support and develop that we haven't had before. Thank you very much. Well, we'll, we'll whiz around the panel with those, those questions. So thank you. Um, I'll start, if I may, just by responding to, to Richard, uh, who asked the question about the role of government in supporting industry and the MSC's perspective on that. I mean, I think um, in terms of this issue, that's a difficult question. And it, I, I often get accused of sitting on the fence here, and I, I, I might well there. But I think we, we what government needs to do is to support those areas that uh, without their intervention, we're not going to make the progress. But clearly we've got to recognize that there is a, a, a challenge, isn't there, that, that was mentioned right at the start in terms of funding and the investment and where does that come from? And that inevitably, I think moving forward is gonna to have to be a balance as we address all the, the various issues that, that, the, uh, that the country faces. Uh, this is one of them and it's a big one uh, arguably the biggest, but there are others as well. So let's get that balance of, of funding right. Who's responsible for the investment in infrastructure, et cetera? I think that's a really good question. The debate will go on, but certainly there has to be a, a part, from my point of view, for government, and they will need to take the lead in certain areas where 
if they don't, we're not going to see the progress that we need. I don't know if that answers your question, Richard, but we'll we'll are happy to discuss that further. And obviously, colleagues can open up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, colleagues. Uh, the other questions then: uh, the uh, challenge of the, um, the the now and not the future. Um, the um, how do we uh, retain our top end engineers to to take on these big challenges, and uh, and then obviously comments uh, relating to our, our final uh, question as well, Paul. Well, on the higher skill side, it, it it's about demand and supply. Um, we've got to increase the supply because there's too, uh, there's so much demand for the small number of really good people that are out there. Uh, we've got to increase the number coming through um, and then the market will settle more. Thank you. Sorry, let's just go around. Sorry. Yeah, if I add to that, I can't speak for the smaller SME kind of level of engineering kind of companies, but leaning again in my experience that irrespective of whether you are a developer, an exploration production company, a defence contractor, large swathes of those engineering resources are limited companies. Uh, and they, through IR35, that will obviously change. Um, but they are, and I need to be careful with my words here, but they, they tend to um, move around very quickly to whatever company is paying the highest rate. Um, and some of those companies in those industries don't want to carry the overhead. So for me, it's a commercial challenge as to how that happens, because, you know, we, we do need an engineering capability in the UK across many industries, matter of times, the kind of artery that runs through it all. Um, but there's a commercial angle that gives me a headache at night, because if I'm looking at Belfast, an example, the labour market for engineering is limited. It's exhaustive. Um, so trying to attract the right engineering breadth and skill set, for example, to that location is a challenge unless you are willing to pay a premium. Yeah, I remember that. I mentioned about the nuclear piece and one of the many of the companies, and this is going back many years that I worked with, though, when I asked them that very question, how do you keep it? They just said, we'll pay more, which is not always a, a solution. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alan, and then. Uh, yeah, I mean, as we've said, engineering as a whole is just struggling to uh, recruit and retain uh, engineers. I guess from a seafaring perspective, um, we're not as limited location-wise as to where engineers come from. And pay is maybe not the biggest driver. Uh, obviously, when you're working and living in the same space, um, the conditions of your living environment can actually have a, a major impact, um, as well as the time between home uh, and away. So even although we're not um, shackled by location, the engineering or the marine engineering profession still has exactly the same sort of issues where location isn't the issue um, in trying to recruit and retain um, people for the future. Yeah, thank you. David. Um, oh, I'll dip in. I was just to Kerry's point about the the technologies being here and now. I think that's a really important one. And as a company that was formed with the mission of decarbonizing maritime, that's what we're here to do. It was um, it it wasn't really an option to decide what you know whether we were ready to make switches. That's what we were doing, and so we kind of had to, we we have to continue to grab things by the scruff of the neck and with the support of people like the Workboat Association, MCA, and just say, well, we better start developing some regulation around the stuff that we can demonstrate to you is going to make a tangible difference. And, it, and, and that really ties into my second point about using um, digital models to demonstrate and guide us to certain areas. And those digital models drove us to an electric hydrofoiling solution at the moment um, because one of the main drivers for that was that there was the other criteria for us around was decarbonization and obviously economic sustainability. Economic sustainability without a drive to the bottom, and we talk about costs, that's something that I was pretty adamant about, that it's not easy to maintain a standard of living that is, I would want for everyone who worked in something I'm involved in if there wasn't significant enough barriers to entry in the 
technologies that I bring on through complexity, through investment requirements. So one of the real serious criteria, I think, for where we invest here in, you know, in the in the UK in a reasonably high standard of living, you know, thankfully part of the world, we have to invest in parts of maritime that have barriers to entry through complexity that really make use of the skills we have through the research sector here, through the great engineering we have, as you say, people like that from the super yacht few of them are working with us because we haven't got to drive to the bottom because it's damn hard what we're doing so it's not going to be copied for a while so i think using um going and investing in areas that are correct economically and sustainably digital modeling can drive us there and we can build, build digital twins but then double checking is that going to become a race to the bottom we talk about um some aspects of wind propulsion on ships one of the reasons we've modeled that for many companies around the world as consultants we aren't as attracted to it because we don't see complexity in the solutions when there's no complexities in the solutions it won't reward skills and those jobs will go to lower cost and then it's back to this lack of status and lack of reward which is not something i'm interested in promoting that's really interesting thank you there's a, there's a big connection isn't there by some of the questions that were asked there and then the, the answers in, in interlock for, for sure alan were you going to come on to that one yeah i'm just going to on the, on the topic about the the kind of dual fuel hydrogen lng the vessel design that's going on just now i think we need to look at the bigger picture as well i mean there are vessel and again i'll be careful my words here and um, there are vessel owner operators be they ferries coasters or otherwise that maybe have had their fingers burned in the uk and have down selected new build of uh, opportunities to Turkey, um, Romania, amongst other areas. That's a real issue that, you know, we need to look at ourselves as a, from a governmental perspective that, that's impacting industry. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. And, and, and so what we're getting here is when you, when you start talking about green jobs as opposed to green skills, there's an awful lot of significant issues that underpin those, don't they? And in terms of getting the, the right people in the right place to do the green jobs, both in the now and into the future, we have to address all of these challenges. So it just rec you know, reflects how complex an issue this actually is, doesn't it? Thank you. Um, hope we've, we've done justice to that, colleagues. We're just conscious of time. Uh, we've got Andy Hurley online, Colin McMurray, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do what we did before. If, uh, how tight are we on time? We're getting closer, but what does that mean? We're about to be evicted. Always <laughs> work on that basis. But anyway, we'll, we'll so we can do we'll do a quick quick four if we can. So Andy Hurley, if you come off mute and ask your question, then we'll go round the room to those three, and then we'll uh, ask the panel to wrap it up. Thank you. Are you Hi there, am I visible now? Yeah. Hi. Great stuff. Um, yeah, first of all, just to say, um, fantastic um, event today, really worthwhile, so uh, thank you for that. Um, I work with a, a number of small vessel operators who are looking to go to zero carbon, and one of the challenges is around the uh, skills um, that they need uh, to operate and maintain those vessels, uh, and also, how to demonstrate that they have competent people to operate them to uh, for the MCA. Um, and the question really, I think, is probably aimed at the two guys from Artemis as much as anybody, because I think we've already maybe addressed some of this, is in looking for training solutions. Um, at the moment, we're having to look outside of the marine world, so looking at things from the for EVs, um, so from the car industry, the truck industry, whatever, uh, or looking at actually putting together courses with local colleges, exactly as Artemis has done. But the difficulty is, is actually in, in getting those courses recognised by an appropriate authority. And I wondered what processes there were in place, what um, the uh, MSC were, were doing with that, uh, and how we can move forward with that to make it um, quick and easy to actually put in place training that's appropriate. So it's really looking at how to make um, the, the whole process more agile and dynamic, because although maybe the current electric solutions look like they're, they're, they're going to work for a lot of operators in six years' time, 10 years' time, that may well change. Um, how do we get in place a, you know, a, a route to enable uh, operators to demonstrate competence um, through uh, a regulatory body that's dynamic and agile enough to recognise it? 
Yeah, thanks, Andy. I think you were addressing that really to, to David and Ian from Artemis. So um, yeah. we'll, we'll ask them to answer that and then the mic can come forward if that's okay. And we'll just take three questions at the front, uh, starting with Colin. But do you want to just answer that? Yeah, I, th I think that's a, um, that is a really interesting point about the training. We, we, we reached out to some bodies with our course and I must admit I wasn't the one doing it. So I would, but I would like to get in touch and discuss this because I completely agree with that point. I, if I remember correctly, the answer back from the MCA is it's okay. If it's being done within your body, keep us informed and we'll be fine. And I agree. It'd be nice if we could be a bit more joined, but I don't want to commit to that, but I think it'd be great to have that discussion. I mean, on the training side, we're again, we're having to kind of take that on ourselves. And I, you know, certainly in our simulators, we invest pretty heavily in the physics side. So it is realistic enough to be adequate training um, with and having been to some of the facilities in Holland, for example, that's driven made by institutions like Marin, I can say we're miles ahead here in the UK in physics modeling of vessels. It was pretty poor what's done over there. I wouldn't call that proper training because the physics is so bad. And um, so I think we have great opportunity to use modern technology on the training, which will reassure. I mean, it's really important for us with bringing innovative solutions. And of course, we have exactly the same concerns as some of the operators. But the questioner was mentioning is, you know, how do we operate? How do we maintain? How is it safe? And so I think it's, I see that responsibility in this case on us to demonstrate that, to train, to illustrate that it's possible and safe to do so. Thank you. Um, I am conscious of time, but hopefully colleagues are uh, happy to bear with us just for a few more minutes. We've got the, the three final questions. Uh, Colin McMurray, and the microphone is on the way. Colin is also a commissioner. Uh, so thank you, Colin. Uh, yeah, sorry, just a further question, bringing together some of the strands on the, the sort of training elements is also a factor of safety because my takeaway is greenification is actually a combination of both green skills and green jobs because we're upskilling as to, to the point at the moment where the technology already exists. The green jobs will continue to grow as we hit those new technologies and implement them. But with regards to safety, for example, uh, legislative, you know, to go on board the vessel, you do your firefighting courses, there's no there's no battery fire technology in, contained within that firefighting course. So when, when we're starting to take the point of, you know, a battery fire, and I would urge any colleagues that haven't seen some of the results of, of electric car fires and how they've brought down multi-story car parks and wiped out whole floors of cars. The technology that exists is there today. The firefighting and the IMO regulation on what needs to be put out, you don't put battery fires out with water. You either have to completely submerge it or you've got a big issue. And the, the energy that's contained in that is, is not dealt with in the same manner. So I think we also have to be very mindful about, as we bring in the new technology, the safety, education and training element is, is put in part of that. Yeah, no, thanks, Colin. I, I, I don't know whether colleagues want to respond to that, but I think that, that point is very, very well made. Um, we've got a question at the end of this row as well, please. And then just behind, we'll take the two if we may. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Stagg. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Nautical and STEM here at City of Glasgow College. And my question really is, uh, are we not talking about green skills and green jobs? Because I would argue that being as we're sat at COP26, which has been described as the last best hope for the planet, aren't we all in green jobs? And if we're not, should we not be thinking we are? And therefore, do we have the skill set ourselves Never mind how we're going to equip, how I'm going to equip my faculty to teach skills that we don't know yet to the next generation. So it's it's kind of, for me, the question of the panel is, how do we address the knowledge, skills and attitudes that we need to change in those that lead, manage and change the way we think, as well as the skills for jobs, which will be about uh, technical skills potentially to do with some of the issues that Colin just raised. Great question. Thank you. And we'll take one more and then we'll whiz around the panel. Hi, I'm Catherine Logie from uh, Ocean Technologies Group, which you might know as representing uh, Seagull, Videotel, Marlins, uh, Coex 
Terramarine and more brands. So we cover um, ship management, fleet management software, as well as um, learning and training and assessment um, content and systems. So I have a question for the panel. Um, we're sitting here and I can see this word international above Graham's head. Uh, we're in the UK, but we're here at COP26 thinking in an international context about how we get on this journey to net zero. Somebody asked, do we have the right skills and the right people for the jobs? The answer has to be yes, because we're a global industry, not just a UK industry. So my question for the Maritime Skills Commission is, how are you working uh, with other maritime administrations, other colleges overseas? I'm sure, I know that you're doing a lot here at Glasgow City College to connect internationally, but are we looking at best practice in this area from other countries as well and other employers? That's my question. And my comment, if I can just steal an extra minute, is um, we've talked a lot about cost and uh, there seems to be an underlying assumption that the traditional model of training will continue, whereby we have um, companies supplementing training, we have governments funding training, we have colleges delivering training. Don't forget digital literacy and digital solutions for providing the content, providing the systems and providing the data, the tools that you need to do the job for you. So we can do competency management, we can have all OEMs uploading content onto digital platforms. You can be very agile in how you update content regularly. You can have companies delivering their own training for other companies. Uh, those, so we've got a huge amount of potential and a great deal of agility and versatility with the technical delivery platforms that are available today, which also can enable entry into the maritime sector for groups that might not currently be aware of it, such as women, such as maybe more uh, remote communities and other sectors. So a question and a comment. Thank you. Thank you. For that. I think your question was very much directed at the Commission. And uh, what, what it would say is we've done some work uh, on exports and, and all of this information is available on the website. And we are looking at internationalizing and best practice and also recognizing that we've got a significant amount to offer uh, internationally. So uh, I don't I think my panelists would necessarily uh, answer that, but please, uh, happy to come to discuss that, but do look at the website. And we've also done a piece of work on digital learning, uh, and we need to do more work on the learning piece as, as the Commission, because there are very, very many different ways that we can uh, provide access to this. So what I suggest now is we just go around the panel and they can uh, uh, summarise and, and finish relating to those two questions. Yeah, absolutely. I know it's an interesting point. And actually, I'm glad Paolo's here because within one of our clean maritime demonstration competition um, projects that we're in, we're working closely with Queen's University. And actually, part of that project is around manufacturing these technologies of the future. Um, and we're working with them to simulate the processes of how to safely assemble these battery systems and how to safely install them. So we are looking to utilize that digital technology um, and that way we're able to sort of distribute it worldwide so these technologies can be used around around the world. Uh, just to Mark's point earlier, I would, I would agree that one, and one enables the other in terms of green skills, green jobs. I think they're, they're not one and the same. Um, I think that, that one of the points I made earlier about the collaboration between businesses, education providers, trade unions and other stakeholders, I think it's critical from a top-down perspective to drive it. And I think just to kind of finish that I'm not sure who's part of this process from a business perspective, but we would be very keen to support that. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Um, I think, um, Mark, that was a, a really valid um, point you've made about training and when we are essentially advancing so fast technologi technologically, then who do you get to do the training for the, the next generation? Um, now that might end up being collaboration with the system manufacturers um, coming into the colleges or lecturers going across to uh, the manufacturers and getting some training from them. But yeah, it's definitely a chicken and egg kind of situation. Um, there are obviously prototypes out and running for various systems um, that you could have um, collaboration with those ship companies, the manufacturers and um, colleges. But yeah, it's another great question that really needs um, to be looked at uh, as we progress. There's a lot to all these questions in there. Final word, Paul. So I'd like to take a step out of that detail and just say that implicit in all the questions today uh, and the talks 
Um, there's so many pockets of great examples of stuff that's happening in the sector. Um, to me, the word going forward is ownership. Um, I make a living out of providing support and advice to our member businesses. I need to put them front and center of owning their own sustainability agenda from today uh, and empower them to do that with res resources and support. But also think as a sector, this is the role for Maritime Skills Commission to step up and take ownership of this agenda now on behalf of the sector, because we're all going to support you. Um, but this bit of steerage and ownership uh, will also empower us more to go back to government because they've got to make a contribution as well. Thank you very well said, Paul. And uh, I think uh, the one thing I take from that, you, you're talking about uh, responsibility. I think the Commission has got responsibility, like you say, and that's why we're doing this. But I think we also have individual responsibility, which is what I think what your question is. And we've got to, in whatever we're doing, is be directing this and making sure that uh, we are addressing the green skills, green jobs, uh, wherever we can. Colleagues, thank you very much indeed. Um, I made reference earlier to the fact that we are uh, an all-male panel up here. Just wanted to uh, re-emphasize that we've been joined by many of the commissioners on the Maritime Skills Commission today. Um, Nikki's in the audience. We've got Chrissy with us here today, obviously from the MSC. We've got, uh, we heard from Karen and other colleagues who are, are um, online. So we saw the commission representation today being an extension of the panel because many of the questions and comments that have been raised are directed directly at the commission and you're, you're calling for us to respond or to act on some of these things that are said. So although it looks somewhat male on, on here, uh, hopefully we did have that uh, appropriate balance across the commission, but not everybody could join us in Glasgow today. And uh, it's something we've taken very seriously. If you look at the membership, you'll see we are balanced uh, right across the piece. And we also have the regional representation as well. Can I thank everybody for attending online and uh, in the audience. Thank you very much for your questions, but particular thanks. Obviously, it's already been said to the sponsors and the organizers. Thanks to Chrissy Clark, who's, who uh, again has amazingly organized this. And, and then thanks Paul, Alan, Alan, Ian and David for your fantastic contributions. Uh, I think we'd all like to um, speak to them further and in more detail if that was possible, but I think they've been rich answers. And what it's shown us is this is a complex topic and one that we'll return to, but one clearly that the MSC has a role in playing. Can I please ask you to show in your usual way your appreciation of our panelists? Thank you. Uh, great session. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, you know, if you're traveling, safe journey home. Thank you. <laughs>